Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are studying 2 Nephi chapters 31 through 33. And this is going to conclude Nephi's record. He's taken us through over a hundred pages of the Book of Mormon, nearly a, a fifth of the book. And in these th three short chapters, it seems as though he's really trying to tie everything together and emphasize the point that he's been trying to make to us over these hundred pages, and that is to follow the Savior. He, he's really putting an exclamation point on his lifelong testimony that he has shared with us. And so as we, as we look at these three chapters, I hope that we look through this, through those chapters, through that perspective, that here Nephi has an opportunity to give us one final teaching. And so in his mind, it ought to, it, it, it's obvious going to be the most important thing that he could share with us. So what he really, really wants us to know and understand in our day. Before he gets much into, into those things, I love how he begins chapter 31 with two important pieces of counsel. The first one is found in verse 3, where he says, The Lord speaketh unto men according to their own language, unto their understanding. I love how he's teaching here that the Spirit speaks to us in different ways. It's our responsibility to listen, but as we make our best effort to listen to him, the Lord will figure out a way to help us hear him. And then through verses 2 and 3 of that same chapter, I also love how Nephi tells that he loves plainness. He uses the word plainness. And that's the way he loves to teach. That's how he understands. And I like how he makes that important point as a word of wisdom, maybe even a word of caution, to keep things simple. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. Let it be enjoy, enjoyable to live the gospel in plainness in simplicity because sometimes when we make things busy and overcomplicated, not only can we overshadow and set aside the things that are most important but when we when we dig into a way that complicates things it, it just kind of muddies the water and nephi says keep it simple stay strictly focused on the savior and let the gospel be enjoyed this idea of keeping things simple, it reminds me of the conversion of Brigham Young. Brigham Young was not like a lot of the early converts of the church who just read the Book of Mormon and quickly sought baptism or didn't even finish the Book of Mormon and just wanted to be baptized and join with the saints because they had that instant testimony in their heart. Brigham Young wasn't like that. He got a hold of the copy of the Book of Mormon and he studied that book for two years before accepting the invitation to be baptized. Now, about 20 years after his baptism, he was reflecting on his conversion process. And I'm going to read you his quote, um, but it, it, it goes hand in hand with Nephi's counsel here, of keeping things simple, because if we keep it simple, the Spirit will be able to penetrate our hearts, our ears, our minds, and speak to us in those unique ways. So Brigham Young on this. He said, if all the talent, tact, wisdom, and refinement of the world had been sent to me with the, Brig with the Book of Mormon and had declared in the most exalted of earthly eloquence the truth of it, undertaking to prove it by learning and worldly wisdom, they would have been to me like the smoke which arises only to vanish away. So in other words, if... Somebody had brought me the Book of Mormon and tried to overcomplicate things, it would have vanished away. It would have meant nothing to me. In fact, it didn't mean anything to him. He continues on to what did mean something to him. He says, but when I saw a man without eloquence or talents for public speaking, who could only say, I know by the power of the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, then the Holy Ghost proceeding from that individual illuminated my understanding, and light, glory, and immortality were before me. I was encircled by them, filled with them, 
And I knew for myself that the testimony of that man was true. What wonderful counsel from Nephi, and what a great example from Brigham Young. All right, so with those two things in mind, let's take a look here at the reading assignment, these three chapters. Now, chapter 31 is really cool. You've got Nephi speaking, of course, but you've also got the Savior speaking and also the Father. We don't have very much recorded words of Heavenly Father. But in chapter 31, as you pay attention, who's speaking and who's saying this and whose turn is it to talk, to talk now, you'll see that this is a nice conversation between the Father and Son as recorded by the prophet Nephi. So unique, so cool. And so take, take a look at that as we go through it as well. But in chapters, or in chapter 31, yeah, uh, but verse 7 through 9, Nephi is teaching that the Savior was baptized. And after he was baptized, he received the Holy Ghost. And as he, as he was baptized and he had the Holy Ghost, now Nephi is asking, uh, why? Why was the perfect Son of God baptized? And then the Savior answers that question by saying, now follow me. Come and do the things that you've seen me do. He set the example before us to do those things, to be baptized and to receive the Holy Ghost. And in verse 10, he says specifically, follow thou me. And then Nephi says, wherefore, my beloved brother, and can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? And so when the Savior says, follow me to be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost, great. And when those two steps are accomplished, are we done following him? No. So what do we as baptized members of the church who have received the Holy Ghost, how do we continue to follow him? Fortunately, Nephi and the Savior and the Father teach us the answer to that very question. Let's go down to verse 12. And also the voice of the Son came unto me, saying, He that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost. So when those two steps are done, then follow me and do the things which you have seen me do. Well, how do we know then what to do? What is step three in that? What do we do and how do we, or excuse me, let's back up. How do we know what to do so that we can then go and do it? Nephi fortunately answers that very question for us in chapter 32, verse 3 where he says halfway through that verse, Wherefore I said unto you, Feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. So if you say, well, what, how do I, what do I do to follow the Savior? Nephi says the answer is found in the words of Christ. And that would be the Book of Mormon, other scripture, and the words of the prophets, and the words of the Savior himself. So feast upon the words of and you will know what to do. But there's more help than just that. In verse 5, I say unto you that if you will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, so if you're baptized and receive the Holy Ghost, and now you want to know what to do in following the Savior, or to follow the Savior, then it was, says this, that the Holy Ghost will show unto you all things what ye should do. So the formula is simple, right? Nephi says, I want to keep this plain and simple. And it couldn't be more simple. First you're baptized, then you receive the Holy Ghost, then you feast on the words, you listen to the Holy Ghost, and now you know what to do to follow the Savior. But it gets even easier than that. If we go to Moroni, chapter 7, verse 33, Moroni is quoting the Savior when he says, And Christ hath said, If you will have faith in me, Ye shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. It is just that simple. It's plain, easy to understand as Nephi is hoping for us. So what do we do? Obtain the word, then listen. And then he will give us power to do the things that he's asked us to do. This is a summary of, ne of Lehi's dream, or a big part of it. Hold fast to the iron rod and press forward in doing so. 
Don't get distracted, but listen to the right voices. And if you do those things, you end up with power from the Savior, as represented by power from the Savior to do those things, and the blessings of the gospel, the power and the blessings represented by the fruit. Um, and so here Nephi is just kind of bringing it all together for us, but out of Lehi's dream and out of Nephi's dream and bringing it into uh, relevancy in our, in our own daily life today. Now, these things that we've talked about, what Nephi has taught with the usage of the Savior's and the Father's words, this, this isn't something that we just get when we're reading this chapter out of 2 Nephi of the Book of Mormon. We get reminded of this every single week when we go to church and partake of the sacrament. Let me show you how. In chapter 31, going back, now we're in verse 7, talking about the Savior being baptized. Nephi asked the question, Know you not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh, through his baptism, he humbleth himself before the Father and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. That ought to sound familiar because that's the sacramental prayer there. Now let's keep that in mind as we go to verses 12 and 3, also of chapter 31. And we find that there's a lot of things that we're to do, not only in these verses, but there's a lot of things that we're to do. Yet the Lord, here in, the, in verse 13, He permits us to receive a full measure of the blessing, not by what we've done, but thankfully by the willingness to do what he's asked us to do. So in 13, wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if you follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism and by receiving the Holy Ghost, then you can receive the promised blessing of having his spirit to be with us. So let's take this and let's mingle it with the blessing on the bread, the sacramental prayer. And witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they are willing, and then it lists three things. So although I'm going to add the word willing a couple of extra times, grammically, grammically? I'm trying to say grammically. Is grammically even a grammatical word? I don't know. So let's say it that way. Grammatic, grammatically? Looking at it through grammar, proper grammar, we could say that willing could be inserted before each of these three bullet points of what we are willing to do. So let's take a look at it. And witness unto thee that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy son and willing to always remember him and willing to keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Now, that's a perfect definition of the mercy, love, grace, kindness that the Father and Son extend to us. You want the blessings? Great. Don't worry about being perfect. Just be willing. And like Nephi says, with real intent. Don't be fake about it. Don't pretend to be willing when you're really not. But with real intent, give your very best effort. And the Lord takes care of the rest of it and gives us the promised blessings. Now, before we get out of chapter 31, there's just a couple of points that are worth mentioning. When talking about baptism being the gateway to the straight and narrow path, take a look at how straight is spelled. It doesn't mean a straight line, but it's S-T-R-A-I-T. -T. Now this spelling's different. This straight refers to a narrow or close entryway. In other words, the straight way means that the only way is through Jesus Christ. This is your opportunity. You don't have this opportunity and kind of choose how to get into this path. It's narrow. 
and it's small because it's singular, the entryway. It's only through Jesus Christ and in no other way that we can get onto this path that leads back to our Heavenly Father. It's also worth pointing out, I think, that in verse 18, we learn more about this, this straight way. When we find, and then you are in this straight and narrow path, so after baptism in the Holy Ghost and willingness to do the things the Lord has asked us to do by following Him or in following Him, and when you are in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life, yea, ye have entered it by the gate, ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which He hath made, that ye are entered in by the way ye shall receive. Ye, ye should receive. So you've done those things that we've talked about in the early part of chapter 31, and now you're on the path. Okay, and now to move down the path, we're going to do the things that he teaches us as we've already talked about and defined through the scriptures. But President Nelson talks about this path. He calls it the covenant path. And one thing that we need to keep straight and always remember is that the covenant path is not the ordinance path. We can't say we've accomplished all of our ordinances or we've entered into those covenants with God, and so we're at the end of the path. President Nelson says, no, you're misunderstanding if that's what you believe. He says, we choose to progress on the Lord's covenant path and to stay on it. It is not a complicated way, but it is the way to true joy in this life and eternal life beyond. So how do we stay on it? By keeping those covenants, not by checking off the ordinances as having done that, but by keeping the covenants entered into through the ordinances. It's an important distinction there. Nephi tells us that it's an important distinction when we continue on into verse 20. Wherefore, so after we're on the covenant path and we've gone through all the ordinances, if we have, that's not the end of the row. That's not the end of the covenant path. That's just the beginning. As Nephi teaches, wherefore, once we're on this path, Ye must press forward with steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Nephi, once again, is recapping in that verse everything we learned about Lehi's or from Lehi's dream. In fact, he uses the same words that Lehi used. He described the people as pressing forward. And Nephi interpreted the iron rod as the word of God. So as we press forward, clinging to the words of Christ, we move down the covenant path. See how this is just a wonderful recap of what we've gone through? Just re, not re-emphasize. Well, yeah, re-emphasize. I was going to say overemphasize, but that would be impossible. But re-emphasizing for sure. Now we get to chapter 32. We're going to shift gears just a little bit here and just kind of highlight some more of this counsel. We've already been through 32, speaking of verses 3 and 5 specifically, as it correlated to what was being taught in chapter 31. And so let me just kind of pull out some, some little nuggets here that I loved. Verse 9, But behold, I say unto you that ye must pray always and not faint, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Lord in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. There's a lot that can be pulled out of there. Let me just give you one of 10,042 things that could be learned from that verse. And that is this. I love how he teaches that we don't just pray for the things that we need or want, but we pray to do the things that the Savior wants us to do. And as we do those things, the Lord's going to bless us and, and consecrate our efforts. In other words, he's going to give us power to do what the Savior wants us to do, as Moroni promised at the end of the Book of Mormon. Remember how we started this about keeping it simple? 
It is so simple. It's the same message, just packaged in different ways. So that like we, what we talked about before, chapter 31, verse 2, the Lord can speak to us and get this message through in our own unique and different ways. It's amazing. So what a promise found there in verse 9. Pray always, faint not, gives us those, that charge that that you must not perform anything until you pray about it so that the Lord is on your side and helping you do those things that he wants you to do and the things that you want to do. It makes me think of Alma chapter 37, 37, chapter 37, verse 37, where Alma gives this, this counsel again. He says, in fact, he uses the word counsel with the Lord in all thy doings. And he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord that he may watch over you in your sleep. And when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. And if you, if you do these things, you shall be lifted up at the last day. Let's conclude here with chapter 33, with the concluding words of Nephi. In verse 4, and I think this is the only verse I'm going to talk about in this chapter. In verse 4, and I know that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. See how it just tied into verse 9 that we just went through? And the words which I have written, I'm going to read through it and then go back and kind of highlight some things. And the words which I have written in weakness will be made strong unto them, for it persuadeth them to do good. It maketh known unto them of their fathers. And it speaketh of Jesus, and persuadeth them to believe in him, and endure to the end, which is life eternal. Now here Nephi is writing his record for a purpose. He lists the purpose here in verse 4. And he uses the word them, those people who get my words, who are going to read them. Well, who's, who's reading his words? You and I are right now. So the latter day, people in the latter days will be able to read his words. For what purpose? And the words, meaning his record, or the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon, which I have written in weakness, will be made strong unto them, the readers. For it persuadeth them to do good. In other words, it will encourage the reader of the Book of Mormon to live a higher, holier way. Continuing on, it maketh known unto them of their fathers. Talking about genealogy. Just kidding. It's not. I don't think it is. I think what Nephi is saying is to make us know, make known to us the covenants which God has made to our fathers or the people of the Book of Mormon so that we can understand that God is wanting, desiring to make those same covenants with us. Continuing on, make it, uh, make it known unto their fathers. We just did that. Speaks of Jesus, and it speaketh. What speaketh? The Book of Mormon, his words. It speaketh of Jesus. It's a testament of him. It helps us come to know him. And persuadeth them to believe in him. Persuades us, encourages us, points us to the Savior, and it persuadeth the reader to endure to the end. And so as we go through the simpleness, the plainness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's encouraging to be a part of it, to say, you know what? I can do that. You know what? I should do that because I know of the love and support and companionship and the blessings that will come to me from a loving Heavenly Father as I live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nephi makes living the gospel super easy because it is. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.